was a cool morning, just before the sun rose. I could see my breath in small, nervous puffs in the cold air. Everyone around me were breathing out similar clouds of frosty anticipation. We jumped up and down, swung our arms back and forth, twisted from side to side, blew into our hands and rubbed them together to stay warm. The air was alive with excitement and nervous chatter. Everyone was eager to begin. I took a deep breath and then another, long and slow, trying to settle my nerves as we waited for the signal to begin. This moment had been a long time coming and I was ready for it. With weeks of training and over 200 miles behind me, I was ready to go, ready to stop worrying about whether or not I had what it took to finish and just finish. The sun was up now, our breath not so visible anymore. There was music playing and a crowd cheered loudly. The announcer started the countdown and suddenly the wait was over. We were off, feet moving, arms pumping, I crossed the starting line. The race had begun. Since that first race, I've crossed several other starting lines, some more nerve wracking than others, but each a mix of excitement, eagerness, and apprehension. And you know that feeling, even if you yourself have never waited at a literal starting line you know what it feels like to be on the verge of beginning something new. It's that tightness that sits deep in your belly, a mix of excitement, dread, maybe a little bit uncertainty about what's about to happen. It's that unsettling beauty and that feeling you get when you stand on a cliff and look down. See, our lives are a series of beginnings whether it's a new relationship, a new job, a new home, a new experience of some sort, we're well versed in beginnings, even if we're not always at ease with them. We often take time to recognize these many beginnings as liminal spaces, these thresholds that let us look back on where we've been and look forward to what will be. These beginnings open us up to a new way of being in the world, and they show us something new about our, ourselves. So it makes sense that we take time to mark and celebrate these major beginnings. Tis the season now of graduations and weddings. If you haven't been to one yet, I'm sure you will be sooner or later. But we also celebrate new babies, retirements, baptisms, birthdays. David's birthday today. <laughs> All of these are beginnings of something new. And even funerals, in their own way, mark the beginning of life in a new way. And a little later, during our time of prayer, we'll take a moment to honor our graduates, to mark this beginning for them, to celebrate their accomplishments as we look back over how far they've come, and try not to embarrass them too much. That's either the good side or the bad side about being new. I don't know all the embarrassing stories yet. So, graduates, you're safe for now. And this time of celebrating our graduates will be a time to catch our breath and recognize and acknowledge how fast life goes. We'll take a breath, a deep breath, to pray for all the graduates, for all the challenges ahead of them, and we'll take a breath to speak a blessing over their commencement the beginning of a new chapter. This morning, Mary read two stories of beginnings, one cosmic and one communal, one poetic and the other prescriptive, each showing us what it means to be made in the image of God and live as people of hope. So we start in the beginning, a very good place to start. 
In the beginning, that beginning of all beginnings, God spoke. Each word a new creation, each word a blessing. In the beginning, God spun the world into being with poetry and with passion. This first chapter of Genesis is one of my favorite passages of scripture. I didn't make Mary read the whole thing because it's really long. And it's long because it keeps repeating itself over and over. But the repetitions serve a purpose. If we had read the whole thing, you would have heard the heartbeat of creation. The repetitions fall into a rhythm that sounds like a heartbeat, bringing the world into life, day by day, word by word. God said, let there be, and there was, and it was good. Evening came, and morning followed, the first day, the second day, and so on. It's a beautiful and poetic passage, but my love for this scripture goes beyond its mechanics and its content. You see, behind the beautiful words and imagery are a people who aren't so different from you and me. See, this part of Genesis was written after the temple was destroyed for the first time, and many of the Israelites were carried into exile. So there they were, a people in exile, lost in a strange land, with everything that they held sacred lying in shambles. And they're left wondering, wondering about their world, wondering about how all this that is came to be, wondering about their purpose and place in a world that's been turned upside down and inside out. These questions that they have have echoed down through the ages and yet somehow still feel very much alive today cries for hope still very much needed in a world full of suffering and chaos. These were people without a home, in need of hope, when God gave them this heartbeat, this reminder that from the chaos, God brings beauty, and into the void, God speaks life. A reminder we all need when our temples are destroyed and when we wander through the world feeling like exiles. This beauty of creation brings us back to ourselves. It reminds us that amidst the chaos and confusion of this world, that we are made in the image of God. Sometimes we need to hear this word of hope, but at other times, other times we're called to speak this word of hope to others. As you see, created in the image of God means we too have that power to speak life into the void and bring beauty from the chaos. Several years ago, a team of educators and researchers sought to address the increasing rate of students dropping out of school. I tried addressing this very old problem in a new way. Instead of looking at what factors contributed to high dropout rates, the team instead chose to focus on students that stayed in school. They wanted to learn about the factors that kept these students from dropping out. And as the team talked to all these students, many of whom faced similar challenges to their classmates who had dropped out, a consistent theme emerged. Almost every student mentioned an adult by name who they felt cared about them, cared enough to check in on them, cared enough to encourage them, cared enough to believe in them and make them believe in themselves. So the strongest force keeping a student from dropping out of school was having a teacher, a coach, a neighbor, a boss, someone who cared enough to speak life and beauty into the chaos of their world. Last week, Pentecost reminded us that we've all been given a divine language. Today, we look at how God calls us to use that language to speak, to speak life into the world, to speak beauty into our community, and to speak love into the lives of each other. Because the world needs to hear from you. 
every day countless opportunities to speak up and speak out. Each day is another beat of that ongoing rhythm of creation. Using the same old materials of earth, air, fire, and water, every 24 hours, God creates something new out of them. Frederick Buechner writes, And if you think you're seeing the same show all over again seven times a week, you're crazy. Every morning, you wake up to something that in all eternity never was before and never will be again. And the you that wakes up was never the same before and will never be the same again either. Evening came and morning followed. A new day, a new beginning, a new opportunity to join the ongoing work of creation. Because to be created in God's image also means to participate in the community of God's creation. In the Acts passage, we find the same group brought together on Pentecost, fully engaged in what it means to be community. No longer held together by the gravitational force of Jesus' physical presence, they had to find a new center. And this is the beginning of the church, a group of people trying to figure out what it means to live as communal witnesses of the gospel. And it's a beautiful beginning. Trouble and disagreements would follow, as they often do, but for now, it's enough to celebrate their togetherness and to take note of how they cultivated that spirit of community. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. They were a learning community, a fellowshipping community, a welcoming community, and a praying community that sounds like a community I'm getting to know. And each one of these factors is a sermon unto itself, but wait, there's more. That's not all they did. Luke goes on to describe the other beautiful but arguably more challenging practice of this early church. He talks about how they shared all that they had with each other. Luke writes how they would sell their possessions and distribute the proceeds to all as they had need. Now, the writer of Luke and Acts has always been concerned with money, recognizing from the beginning how the values of a worldly economy run counter to God's economy. Where the world cries out for more, 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 and claims everything is mine, 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 God says, there is enough if you be but good stewards of it. Now, don't get antsy. All this talk about selling possessions and sharing all things in common. I'm not about to announce the beginning of the Community Baptist Commune. That'll come later. Just kidding. <laughs> See, not very many communities have been able to sustain such a model for very long. Even that first community eventually ran into trouble and disagreement about the even distribution and collection. So instead, I want to focus our attention on what Luke's description of the community just prior to the bit about possessions and property, when he says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. You see, this is an intimate community that shared life together. And sharing life means so much more than just sharing possessions. There's no room to hide in this community. Every fault, every flaw, every weakness laid bare. Alongside every strength, every success, everything of beauty. All are welcome in this community. Every part is welcome. Being in this community means that we bring all that we are to the table. And this is not an excuse to be ugly to each other and to brush it off by saying, that's just me, that's just the way I am, deal with it. No, rather, bringing all of ourselves to the table is an invitation to be who God made you to be, to share your strengths and to trust others with your weaknesses, to speak words of life and to hear words of comfort, to laugh and cry together as members of this beautifully messy and sacred body 
we call the church. Thank God we do not run this race alone. Evening has gone, the morning has come, a new day has dawned, a new beginning. What will you do with it? Amen.